Oh, hey! Finally decided to wake up. I thought you were dead or something. Hey there, everyone. Hidden Gems Reviews here for more quick tips. This time, we'll be going over the very basics of Let It Die. If you're at all interested in playing or just need a quick refresher if it's been a while, this video should be perfect for you. I won't go over the story or bosses to leave those as a surprise, more just cover getting started and the best tactics for playing. I have another video I made if you want some more helpful tips regardless of your playtime. Check the link in the description or click the card at the end of the video. Also, since there's quite a bit to get into, I'm splitting this video into several parts. That way you're not stuck here for more than half an hour, but also you can jump into whatever you want to focus on most if you don't need every little detail. With this first part, I'll be focusing on the game's stats, character classes, and the waiting room and its various functions. Let's get started! Here, I got a tip for you. After you finish up the tutorial, you'll be able to create your own character, with only one fighter class to choose from. However, after a bit of time playing, you'll start unlocking more, with a combined eight to choose from. All-rounder, striker, collector, defender, attacker, shooter, skill master, and lucky star. Now, a question I got a bit in my last video was what class was best to choose. We'll come back to specifics later, but right now, let's talk stats before we get into the classes any further. We've only got six to focus on. HP, stamina, strength, dexterity, vitality, and luck. HP is exactly what it sounds like, your maximum hit points. That's really all there is to it. Lose them all and... <laughs> Stamina reflects your overall capacity to take action, such as running, attacking, dodging, and blocking. Essentially, the higher your stamina, the more you can do before taking a rest. Your stamina in-game is reflected by your beating heart, which fluctuates between colors depending on how low your stamina is, from yellow to red to purple. Expend too much stamina, and you'll be struck with exhaustion, which leaves you completely vulnerable. Keeping an eye on your stamina is incredibly important, much like it is in the Souls series. Next, we have your Strength stat, which dictates how much damage you can do with any weapon that doesn't use ammo. This includes your fists as well, which are just as important as any weapon you'll pick up. We'll touch on that later, too. Dexterity is the same as Strength, but is for ammo-based weapons like the Fireworks Launcher or the Glinty Magnum. Vitality affects the damage you take when you get hit. This stat is also compounded by the type of armor and gear you wear, with higher vitality percentages guarding you for more damage. And lastly, we have Luck. Luck is probably one of the most important stats, surprisingly. Luck not only increases the chance of you scoring a critical hit with each attack, but it also affects the quality of your pickups and how many kill coins you get whenever you take out an enemy or break open a container. The floor you're on does somewhat affect this too, but the money you get is almost entirely up to how much luck you have. So, if you're trying to score more cash, it's best to go with a class and gear that's luck-based. Whew, that was quite a mouthful. Let's move on to another. Class Specifics. As explained earlier, you've got eight classes to choose from, and you'll unlock all the rank one versions after you get to the sixth floor. The all-rounder fighter is exactly what it says in the tin. They have evened out stats and are more balanced than the others, with a slightly higher bag size. They're pretty good for just starting out, but you'll pretty much never use them again after you get far enough in. The Striker has boosted HP and Strength stats, making them your resident tank and great for melee weapons. The Collector will be your go-to class for the majority of the game. They boast the largest bag size of any fighter, and since a lot of your time will be spent trying to get materials to create new weapons and armor, you'll find yourself running out of space all the time. Collectors are necessary if you want to have long treks through the Tower of Barbs, storing your huge stash of healing items or mushrooms as you get further up. Their stats are roughly the same as an all-arounder starting out too, so they're still pretty balanced out. Defenders have your highest HP stat in the game, along with boosted vitality. Their primary use will be for Tokyo Death Metro, the sort of multiplayer component of Let It Die. However, they aren't terribly useful for scaling the tower itself, even against bosses. Next, we have the Attacker, who is your Glass Cannon. The Attacker has very low base HP, but makes up for it with boosted strength and dexterity, higher than pretty much any other class. Have you gotten good at dodging enemies and conserving your stamina? Attackers are your cup of tea with insane damage output, then. Shooter is... useless. Don't bother. Even later on in the game, you'll never find a use for their boosted dexterity, since their other stats suffer greatly. And even though the higher-ranked versions are better, you'll find more use out of the other fighter types. Up next, we've got the Skill Master, who you can slap more skill decals onto. Pretty much their stats are the same as a Collector, with less overall luck. Speaking of, our last class is the Lucky Star. They have, you guessed it, the highest luck stat of the bunch. Their other stats are on par with an all-rounder too, so if you want to do some money grinding, you'll like them quite a bit. So to answer my previous question of what class is best to go with, I'd always recommend the Collectors, with the other ones being very situational. Now, however, comes the tricky part. You might notice after a short while of playing, you've maxed out your character's level to 25 and can't strengthen them any further. That's because there aren't just classes to worry about, but ranks of classes too. After you've killed your first Don, the resident big bads of the game, you'll unlock a new rank of characters who not only start with stronger stats, but can get to higher levels too. 
This means you'll be throwing out your old characters fairly often so you can use the better ranked ones. As a result, you never become attached to them, which is why there's no real character customization like in many other RPGs. And that's the name of the game, Let It Die. Take its title to heart because, at one point or another, you'll lose everything. Money, gear, resources, and even your own characters can be lost. All of us are shaking about as a result of your fighter being captured. It's bound to happen no matter how familiar you get with the mechanics, enemy patterns, or even the maps themselves. If you think you can get past that, or if you've already gotten used to it with other games like Binding of Isaac, Darkest Dungeons, or, of course, Dark Souls, then Let It Die can be quite a good time. Otherwise, I'd actually recommend playing a different game entirely. This video won't really convince you anymore on why you should get invested in it. It's not about how many times you die, it's about how many times you try. <laughs> oh, damn. Rhyming feels good. If you're still willing to give it a go and want some more advice, let's keep on then. Next, we'll go over your base of operations, the waiting room. This is your hub area, providing you with various different services. Let's start from the right and work our way around. First up is the character freezer. In here, you can perform various actions for your fighters, such as renaming them, moving their equipment, swapping them out, and creating new ones. You can also trash any character you won't be needing anymore, which gives you some extra currency. You can also check up on the status of any characters not currently in the freezer here as well, so if they died in the tower or if they've been captured, you can find out. Lastly, you can pay a fee to bring the character's body back if they were killed, or pay a ransom fine if they've been kidnapped. Next up, we have the rewards box. Every day you play, you can get new daily items that'll show up in here, along with your quest and Tokyo Death Metro War rewards. Right by that, you have your storage chest where you'll, obviously, store any spare items you have. The storage here is small initially, but you can upgrade it with any death metals you've collected. This next one you won't have available at the start, but the vending machine hernia gives you access to some very useful, very expensive items, such as ones that act like a teleport back home, and another that lets you take a break when you're in the tower, but don't want to go back to the waiting room just yet. Just to the left of that, you have Choco Funcha, your go-to store for weapons, armor, and crafting. Once you've obtained the proper blueprint and items, you can make all new gear here that'll make your life much, much easier in the tower. You'll be spending quite a bit of time and resources here. Across from Choco Funcha is the Mushroom Club. Here you'll be able to buy or trade in items for skill decals, tattoo-like items that give you different bonuses depending on what you slap on your fighter. There's also a mushroom stew you can buy here, but you may notice at the start you won't have enough space in your kill coin total to buy it. We'll touch on that in a little bit. You'll also find a grill right next to the club to cook your mushrooms in, boosting their effects. Moving on, there's a restroom you can visit, but you won't find yourself dropping any deuces in here, but prisoners. During a raid in Tokyo Death Metro, you'll sometimes have an opportunity to take one of their fighters back to your base, where you'll lock them up in one of your stalls. Every minute they're in here, you'll reap rewards until they're either rescued or unless the ransom has been paid. On the topic of raids, there's also Tokyo Death Metro. Here, you'll be able to invade other players' waiting rooms and rob them of their hard-earned resources and fighters. You can also set up your own fighters and defenses to prevent invaders from robbing you in return. On top of that, you'll be able to spend one of your currencies, SP Lithium, to level up your various facilities. This is how you increase not only your overall kill coin and SP Lithium capacity, but how many characters you can store in your character freezer and how many stalls you have open in the restroom. And right smack dab in the middle is the Vanishing Point, a fountain that not only fully heals your fighter, but it allows you to leave the game and chat with Uncle Death, Mei Jing, and Detox at the arcade. From here, you can get tips, check out the backstory of the tower, and pick up quests. The last three services here are pretty straightforward. First, there's the Mingo Head, a big jellyfish-like creation that you can use to level up your stats until they're completely maxed out. The Elevator and Express Elevator are used to travel to the different floors of the tower, with the Express version allowing free use as long as you're an Express Pass member. And lastly, we have Uncle Prime. Every 20 hours, Uncle Death will deliver an item to your waiting room. The contents are always random, but since you'll never know what you get, it's worth logging into at least once a day to grab whatever's inside. And that covers just about everything in this part. Next time, we'll discuss weapons, mastery levels, and various control tips. I usually don't find myself saying this, but if you want to know when the next part's coming out, be sure to subscribe and share the video with anyone you think might find it useful. If you feel I left anything out, please be sure to let me know in the comments, too. Thanks, and, as always, take care. Are you kidding me? No. Oh, oh, oh.